I'd just like to say a little, this, this section is about a variety of perspectives on the humanitarian crisis. Uh, and I can't help but notice I woke up and read the Washington Post and there was a, a you know, a, a shooting in a synagogue in San Diego. Uh, and there was in Washington, D.C., uh, a presenter who was reading at a, at a bookstore uh, f from his book about uh, what he sees as the rise of white nationalism, who was, uh, who was then uh, shouted down by white nationalists, believe it or not, singing, this land is your land, this land is our land. Um, and so this issue of, the issue of race, the issue of ethnicity, and its entanglement with nationalism is uh, very vivid to me. Uh, and I think that it does go back to the, we'll be able to look more perhaps at the roots, the co roots of colonialism. Uh, I mean, some of, the, some of the struggle that's going on in Rakhine State uh, is a living artifact of the contest between two huge imperial powers, Great Britain and Japan, in the time of World War, World War II, uh, when these different ethnic groups, the Rakhine, who were aligned, they were Buddhist and they were aligned with Japan, uh, were in combat with uh, Muslims in, uh, particularly ones in, uh, in Rakhine State who were aligned with the British, and they did terrible things to each other. Uh, so there's history, but for me, my personal history, I just want to say I became aware of the democracy issues in Burma in 1991 uh, when I started working at the Buddhist Peace Fellowship. And I went, uh, shortly after I, I went to Asia and I went on a witness delegation to uh, this basically liberated area uh, along the river that, uh, the Moy River that was a boundary between Burma and uh, Thailand, and I met many people from the from the rebel groups, from the ethnic rebel groups, from the students groups, from the young monks groups. We were talking, uh, Isaria and, uh, and Naaman and I were talking. We have many friends going back, so that's now 28 years, uh, and. I became very involved with supporting the democracy movement. That really ramped up in 2007 with the Saffron Revolution. And shortly after the revolution in the next month, I led a very small witness delegation to Yangon and to the Thai border town of Maesot, where a lot of the monks in exile were living. And we talked with all the monks we could. We talked with all the people that we could. And it was very scary to be there because we were followed. And uh, we were most concerned, not for our own safety, but that we were jeopardizing the people that we were, that we were meeting. Uh, and it was after that that I started an organization called Clearview Project. Uh, and that organization, kind of our, we had a, a double purpose. And the first purpose was just to inform the Buddhist, the U.S. Buddhist community about what was going on in Burma, about the Saffron Revolution, about the history of modern uh, Burma, and what the human rights and religious issues were. And we reached pretty widely. Uh, I think actually I want to say through uh, particularly through uh, Shambhala Sun and uh, and other uh, or other publications related to your community, uh, but also through Buddhist Peace Fellowship. And the other thing that we did in that time was we raised money from from the Western Buddhist community, and we 
found ways to get that money into the prisons in Myanmar to support monks and nuns who were in prison, to supply them with food and medicine and just basic needs. And we continued doing that until uh, after the quasi-democracy turn in 2012. I've been there a number of times. I've done trainings. And what we also saw then beginning in 2012 and following was uh, the beginnings of, of what appeared to be targeted attacks on, uh, on Rohingya peoples, Muslims in Rakhine State, but also, as we saw in the movie yesterday, in other locations, other Muslims were targeted in other locations in, inside uh, Myanmar. And a group of teachers, very prominent teachers from the U.S. and around the world, uh, we were just stunned that this could be done supposedly in the name of Buddhism, even though we understood uh, that the real uh, driving force behind this was the military. But we also understood that the, to my mind, I would say, and we can discuss this more, the monastic order has had a very ambiguous relationship to the Burmese military. On the one hand, they have resisted it, and they have opposed it, and they overturned their alms bowls so they would not receive alms from corrupt generals. On the other hand, uh, the generals have bought a lot of influence. Uh, they have built a lot of temples, and they have, they have placed a... Uh, they placed a cloth of fear over the entire monastic order. Uh, and so the relationship is complex, but we began, Buddhist teachers wrote uh, asking for, for rights for uh, Muslims, for Rohingya Muslims, and also for a cessation of violence and a cessation of hate speech. And that evolved into uh, an organization that I started, Buddhist Humanitarian Project, which is also a branch of my other nonprofit, Clearview Project. And basically, we've been doing the same work that we've been that I've been doing for a while: writing about the crisis uh, and uh, raising money for direct relief of Rohingyas, mostly ones in exile, but in different places. And we continue to do that. That's part of the purpose of, uh, the underlying financial purpose of this event. But um, we've never forgotten that we are Buddhists. We've never forgotten and we, that there are voices of conscience within the Buddhist community inside Myanmar within the activist community, and we're going to hear several of those uh, today. Um, we don't know where this is going, but we recognize that we have a place of conscience that we have to stand for, uh, where we have to stand for basic humanity basic human values, which we feel is, is really the core of every religious tradition. Uh, and there are people who, for their own purposes, will distort those traditions, usually for purposes of power, or for purposes of money, or because their minds are distorted by hatred. Uh, and we are not immune to that in the United States. And uh, we want to be able to share that awareness and bring support to people who are working for those values, wherever that is. Uh, so I think that's, that's going to be all I need to say at the moment. So thank you.
So I'd like to invite Anna Zuberi to uh, present. Do you want to stand at the podium? Assalamu alaikum, peace be on to all of you. Um, so I'm going to give you just a quick introduction to the genocide. Um, I'm a part of a task force of 38 Muslim organizations that make up the Burma task force. Um, and we've, from that we've branched out in creating the Faith Coalition to, end, to Stop Genocide in Burma, which Alan is a part of, as well as we working, we're working with evangelical Christians on the Hill, um, as well as other concerned uh, people. Um, the coalition is helping Kitchen, Karen, Chin, um, as well as the Rohingyas. So I'll get into some of the work of the coalition and afterwards, but I just wanted to speak to you a little bit about who are the Rohingya, because a lot of people <clears throat> often ask. Oops. I might need a little Can help. You see? Okay. Next slide. So um, Rohingya is an ethno-religious term referring to native Muslim people from the Rakhine state or the Arakan state, located on the southern border of Burma for centuries. Um, they're indigenous people of Burma living in their ancestral lands. This is very important to use this uh, language. I've heard language calling them stateless. I've heard language calling them um, migrants, all sorts of things. This is very important to um, no, because the reason of their expulsion is because they're believed not to be from that area. Um, historically, Burma was never a country, but a group of kingdoms. Burmans occupied Arakan for a mere 40 years before they were defeated by the British, and the modern borders were drawn. In this sense, the Rohingya people say that we did not come to Burma, Burma came to us. Um, and to pass this, um, we also wanted to note uh, that they were always citizens, they voted, and elected their own representatives until 1982. So this is the region where they are. They border Bangladesh. They tend to look a little closer to um, Bengalis than to perhaps the main, um, uh, to Burmans. Um, they're darker in skin color, so as uh, Ken was, um, uh, was noting, racism plays into this in a very um, graphic way. Um, they're called the equivalent of the N-word in their country. Um, so this is something to just keep in mind. According to archeological findings and historians, the Rohingya people have been living in uh, Arakan state for as far back as the eighth century. Both Buddhists and Muslims lived as neighbors until colonialism. There are Christian and Hindu Rohingyas as well. These are some sil silver coins from Kin Nitha Chandra in, um, in his era in 8th century, and the inscription of King Ananda Chandra on, on the pillars. These are proof of that this was a kingdom. Um, and there, these are some coins with Muslim inscriptions. It says, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Um, which is the creed that there's one God and Muhammad is his prophet, and there's Arabic writing on the bottom of these coins, um, leading you to uh, just this is proof that Burhanya used that we are we've been here. We are these are this is this is our land. Um, after Burma's independence from the UK, the United Kingdom's colonization in 1948, the Rohingya were viewed as a hostile minority within the country and discriminated against by the authorities. Um, this is the sort of uh, difference uh, that you have, you can see the sort of apartheid, um, and we we'll use that language of apartheid just so people can understand what is happening to them. Um, Burmese people were allowed, uh, born into and allowed citizenship. Rohingya people, rights to citizenship were taken away in 1982. Um, at that time, and this is pre-2017, one physician available per 700 people. Um, there were no physicians or hospitals available. Um, they, Burmese people can own homes. 
um, can get married, there's no limit on children, on households, they're able to get educated, they have the ability to move and find work. Um, and, um, but the Rohingya people, currently, there are 150,000 at least in Burmese concentration camps, and we have to realize these concentration camps are concentration camps. The amount of food given to the people inside these camps are less than what Nazis gave the Jews, Jewish people in, in Auschwitz. So just to give context to this uh, crisis. Um, uh, and I also want you to note why, how difficult it was to have a child as a Rohingya person. Um, you could not get married without approved government license. Result, if you got married without a license, you would go to prison for 10 years. You could not have more than two children. So imagine you wait, ten, you, you, you cannot get married, and finally you get the uh, permission to get married, and then you can have permission to get, have children, and then these children, as you'll find out later, have, are thrown into the fire and burnt. Babies burnt into the, you know, just thrown into the fire. So the, just the trauma, it, I mean, just the trauma of having a child thrown into the fire, but a child that you had to wait that long to have and go through that many hoops and bribe people to get married. Um, um, so that is, I'm getting a call from somewhere in Denver, Colorado. I don't know if I should pick up this call or not. <laughs> okay, I'll just, um, <laughs> pick it up. Um, okay. The current crisis. So in 1982, the citizenship law uh, allowed the Rohingya people to allow to, for citizenship only if they could speak the officially recognized language and had proof that their family had lived in the country before independence. But most Rohingya were never granted the paperwork to prove these roots. So effectively, they were rendered, like again, CNN will quote that they were rendered stateless. Um, and according to this law, as I was sharing with earlier, a lot of Bur Burmese people would not be able to claim citizenship because there are no such paperwork for any people in that country. Um, this is the most documented genocide in the world because of satellite imagery. Um, this is, um, excuse me if I say it, could you pronounce this? catch up you. On March 9, 2012, this, these are, this is a Rohingya neighborhood, edge of town, um, and then we see what happens. Um, the destruction, October 12, 2012. Same thing, Sitwe, uh, and one of our colleagues is from Sitwe, and this is a very terrifying story. When I first met him, he was uh, a part of this uh, presentation that we were giving. He was sitting in the audience and this was the first time he saw, there was an image of people running from Sitwe, and this was the first time he saw an image of his own family's home burning in the background. Um, so within, um, so 31st October, this is February 2011, this is October 2012. Um, this was the image uh, of, um, uh, these were, Rohingya people marched to concentration camps in 2012. And that is when the Burma Task Force formed because we felt like nobody else was raising this voice and calling it a genocide. It has taken six years for us to get to this point where the Holocaust Museum is agreeing. Um, Amnesty actually disinvited us from speaking on a panel because we used the word genocide. Um, we were told this is not a genocide. You guys are making uh, some of this stuff up. Um, but last December, even the House, uh, even under this administration, has called it a genocide. This State Department report has been one of the most scientifically done report uh, on this issue and has documented um, uh, the genocide in, um, in detail. 21st century concentration camps. After years of anti-Muslim and anti-Rohingya statements by religious leaders and press, especially hateful Facebook posts, Facebook has been a massive recruitment and um, a, a, a vehicle of spreading, disseminating information like the Rohingyas are um, uh, uh, stockpiling weapons in mosques. 
so and about to kill all of their neighbors, so, things like this. Um, and this, these were, this was shared on Facebook, and it took Facebook 1,400 days to take those down. 1,400 days, that's almost four years, and it took a lot of activism and work to get Facebook to uh, do that. And they can't claim to say that they didn't have enough Burmese translators to actually see what was going on, and um, Facebook is used as sort of like a news paper, a news uh, alert system in Burma. Um, so this is something that we wanted to note. Um, the satellite images have shown Burmese villages burning. Refugees blame the uh, Myanmar military, while the Burmese military has claimed that the Rohingyas burnt down their own homes. Um, they fled in hundreds of thousands on land to the ocean on unstable rafts into the forest and towards Bangladesh. Since then, more than 750 refugees have made it to Bangladesh, refugee camps, and more than a million have been slain, either in the hands of the military, the waves of the ocean, or Burmese forests. Um, refugee camps and relief efforts, I'm going to leave this for Ashley to talk about. Just to go over what genocide means, the United Nations first defined genocide in 1948 in the Genocide Convention. The treaty outlines that any of the acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, ethnical, racial, or religious group constitutes as genocide. Below are four acts of the five outlined in the treaty that Myanmar is guilty of committing. Killing members of the group, causing seriously, serious bodily or mental harm, deliberately inflicting conditions of life calculated to bring about the group's physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent birth. And part of the uh, work that um, Burma Task Force years ago used to be Bosnia Task Force. We have been doing this work. Um, a Bosnia Task Force was one of the main uh, vehicles along with the Women Now, uh, National Women's Organization, in calling j rape a a weapon of genocide and a weapon of war. And this very, very critical work is now threatened by our own government because they, because of laws associated with abortion and all of that, they're trying to get that taken out of the UN Charter, that uh, rape can no, no longer be called a weapon of war. And Rohingya women raped. 52% of Rohingya women um, reported, according to a UN report, reported being raped. Um, so I, we showed satellite. You can see uh, the imagery. I don't, I don't know if you can see it clearly. But um, Buddhist homes were marked out, were not burnt down, and Muslim homes were burnt down. Um, I wish we could see this clear. Um, there are mosques in that area, region, that are hundreds of years old. The authorities in Burma um, are carrying out a secret program of ethnic cleansing. And th this is some of our work was getting these statements changed that it's not just ethnic cleansing. And they're not stateless Muslims. They are, it's a genocide of the indigenous people of that land. Their, demo their communities and historical mosques were demolished. Um, we worked, uh, we're dedicated to ending advocating for the Rohingya people and ending genocide in Burma. Um, in the beginning, we started getting a testimony from the people and sending it out. So BBC's first report, that was a conduit, like us being on the ground, being able to get information directly from the ground and sending it on to mainstream newspapers. And um, because a lot of people were not even allowed inside, to journalists weren't allowed. So this is some of the work that... Um, uh, we have been uh, doing and just getting the name Rohingya into the American consciousness because a lot of uh, well, uh, people did not know who the Rohingya people were. Our goals is we want it, and this one goal that we have achieved is to call it a genocide. Um, we want countries to send uh, emergency aid, and even now, like we. Um, and we have been consulting with Rohingya organizations themselves. So everything that we ask for is based on what the Rohingya people want, especially uh, in the diaspora of people who have been in the camps, uh, because we're not impacted, right? I can still live my life here as an American Muslim, but 
they are impacted. So anything that our all our work has been in consultation with uh, Rohingya leaders, um, we demand, where our biggest demand, and this is why we're often blacklisted, is we demand sanction, san sanctions be imposed on the Burmese regime, except for food and medicine. Uh, we believed it worked in the past, before when there were sanctions, um, the military was under control, and, um, and citizenship needs to be returned to the Rohingyas. There can be no repatriation without citizenship and safe, re safe return. Um, I also have, um, I know I've probably gone over time, uh, so I'm going to end it here. Uh, these, this was one of uh, our work is getting the Nobel Peace Laureates to um, call it a genocide. And have a one quick, uh, what, we'll go over what you can do to help as we end. Thank you. Thanks so much, Hannah. Um, I want to say that it's, it was with the support and uh, uh, connection with the, with the Burma Task Force that I was able to go to the refugee camps in Bangladesh uh, a year ago, March. And uh, I think you'll, you'll see in the next presentation some of the, the images of, this, of these camps. Uh, but I would like to underscore uh, two points that and it made the point about genocide and the fact that that has been recognized by international bodies. And it's an important distinction uh, because it sets the stage for other political and uh, economic act actions against the perpetrators of the genocide. And the other point that... Um, that I would make if I can remember it. <laughs> uh, well, it slipped my mind now, but it'll come back. Uh, but let me introduce Ashley Toombs, who works for uh, the NGO BRAC, BRAC USA. And uh, I've been working with them pretty much since I got back from, from Bangladesh. And I've been working with other organizations as well, but uh, we've built a relationship of of trust, and I really think that they're doing fantastic work, and some of the proceeds from this event are going to go to them. So, Ashley? How do I do this? Okay. Give me one minute to get myself set up. Cool. That was much easier than I thought. <laughs> so thank you, Alan, and good morning. As Alan said, my name is Ashley Toombs, and I'm the Director of External Affairs for BRAC USA. I'm really excited and extremely grateful to be here with all of you today, and also to those of you who were able to attend the screening last night. I don't have a lot of time, so I think I'm going to dive right in with a quick introduction to who BRAC is and then our role in the humanitarian response with the Rohingya people in Cox's Bazar, Bangladesh. So BRAC was founded in Bangladesh in 1972, following the country's war of independence from Pakistan. At the time, our founder, who's featured in this picture, Sir Fazli Hassan Abed, had been living in London, working as an accountant for Shell Oil Company. Like many people, Following independence, he went home to assess the situation, but unlike most other people, given the devastation from the war and a series of other natural disasters, he went back to London, he sold his flat, and used the proceeds to fund humanitarian projects which, turned, which eventually turned into what is today known as BRAC's work. Our overarching mission is poverty alleviation, and the organization takes a holistic approach. So we design cost-effective, evidence-based, complementary, and integrated programs in financial inclusion, health, education, legal rights, girls' empowerment, agriculture, and much more. BRAC employs around 100,000 people, and year to year it reaches about 120 million people through its 11 operational countries in Asia and Africa. We also run 16 income-generating social enterprises in addition to another, a number of other related investments. 
The revenue from these enterprises are used to fund about 76% of the social programs in Bangladesh, which are otherwise grant dependent, like most of our other operational countries. We've had a chance to hear a bit about the background of the situation in the humanitarian crisis in Cox's Bazaar today, but to just provide a short overview in the context of what I'm going to talk about. So beginning around August 2017, approximately 700 to 750,000 Rohingya entered Bangladesh from Myanmar after facing a horrifying uptick in persecution you saw in some of the other presentations that there were already around 250 to 300,000 Rohingya living in Bangladesh from previous conflicts, for a total of around 1 million Rohingya living in Bangladesh today. Of that amount, the grand majority are children, with 19% being under the age of five and 36% between the ages of five to 17. For additional perspective, there are around 500,000 Bangladeshi host community members who live in the same area, or at this point, around half of the Rohingya population in Cox's Bazar. I share this because it's also important to remember that in addition to the Rohingya being affected by this situation, the host community members' lives have also changed significantly over the past year plus. So BRAC had been operating in Cox's Bazar for about 35 years at the time of the August 2017 influx. We are the largest civil society responder in the camps with around 3,000 people working across various sectoral areas and have also significantly increased our activities in the host communities. In September 2017, so just about 10 days after the masses of humanity started entering the country, BRAC began responding to the crisis in what I would refer to as triage, mobilizing the necessary resources for survival. So that included shelter, food, water, and offering life-saving health and hygiene programming. So imagine tens of thousands of people, where are they going to the bathroom? People have machete wounds, they have gunshot wounds, women have been delivering babies in the forest on the way there. So the initial sort of phase one, as Brack called it in other organizations, was how do we keep people alive? In 2018, the organization started to shift its scope by strengthening infrastructure and developing more robust and holistic programming. And most recently, we've continued in evolving towards work that promotes more organized living, including a potential sense of permanency in the camps and through developing livelihoods opportunities. Through our efforts, we have registered over 100,000 children on our education programs, planted over 140,000 trees, constructed over 36,000 shelters and replaced about 8,000 more, provided over 180,000 psychosocial support sessions, counseled over 55,000 people on their legal rights, built almost 20,000 latrines, and made over 1.2 million consultations in our 40 healthcare centers. So numbers of this magnitude, the magnitude of this crisis in general can be a lot to take in. So in order to have a better idea of how we work and a sense of what life looks like in the camp, I thought it might be helpful to watch a short video. And this follows a woman named Jamalita, and she's one of our community mobilization volunteers who is also from the Rohingya community. Hopefully this will work. Yes. Pause real quick. Okay. <laughs> Assalamualaikum. Terima Tarot, Tarot, I am where you are, and was in a Hunaway, Tomas in a Hunaki, Balano Guitar, the Gilotta Balara, and if the Matita, the Shavan Hotavatra, who is a man in Balano. 
पाला पाफी हो रे होइन तेरी पाला पाफी हो रे मानि पाला होइ रे मानि पालो होइ बल्ला मानि पालो बल्ला होइ फुतु तियो ल कक यान तुफुला यान तुफुलो हेरे जन हन आफा हन हेरे नसि तो अपो तु तो आला हा गरि न फारे वा दुत काइते यान आला बालाय यो आफै आसे यान आराय जानि ते यान लगियो खिरा दुआ दिए ते हिसाबे ए साथे आला शुक्रिया नय यान pretty amazing. Yeah. Um so to give you a deeper dive on just one of the various programmatic areas that I talked about, I'd like to few, take a few minutes now to walk through how Brack responded to the diphtheria outbreak in the camps. So in December 2017, Brack along with other NGOs was tasked by the government and the World Health Organization to vaccinate children in the camps for diphtheria. a disease you might be unfamiliar with because it's been eradicated in most of the world. The majority of the community volunteers were from BRAC's Communication for Development or C4D program like Jamalita from the video. As the C4D volunteers went door to door with their messages about the vaccination, they were faced with a problem. Most of the Rohingya families refused to vaccinate their children. The biggest reason was that they believed their children would become Christians if they vaccinated them. To overcome the situation, The C4D team adopted and improvised on behavior change in interpersonal communication models which give individuals the opportunities to transition mindsets before achieving complete change. The volunteers went to a total of 40,000 households and conducted several rounds of sessions in each household where they first listened to what the Rohingya had to say and then slowly over various meetings asked questions until the respondent, respondents couldn't come up with a logical answer to their question. In addition, they held separate consultations with local religious leaders, imams, and community leaders, majis. Eventually, most respondents agreed to vaccinate their children, and the success rate for the areas covered by BRAC's C4D program was over 93%. And over 500,000 children were vaccinated by various organizations, about 60% plus by BRAC. And so when I visited Cox's Bazaar last year, I was unfamiliar with a program like C4D, but I was incredibly impressed by the work of these volunteers. They're able to bridge a really important gap between capacity building and technical assistance by respecting the cultural and social belief systems, creating trust and providing life-saving services. So, I was really honored to make the to be asked to make this presentation. And really since then and since this situation has been happening I've been talking about it I get the question a lot how can I help So I thought I would end my presentation with three areas First of all being here today educating yourself on the situation doing research and attending events like this are incredibly helpful Second although it can be awkward to talk about often the best way to get involved is through your wallets Do your research, find organizations you trust that you believe in their work and make a donation if you can. There is still, despite this being in the news as we're seeing, there is still a multi-million dollar gap between the needs that have been identified by UN agencies and other organizations like BRAC um, and there's a big need. So the third area that I would suggest is to consider yourself an ambassador for the affected communities. You are here today educating yourself and you do have a voice. living in this country and being being a part of this public please keep this situation at the forefront of the larger public discourse so i end by thanking all of you for listening to me thanking alan and the clearview project for all of your support and for the organizers i'm i'm so excited to take your questions and to get to know everyone better throughout the day